If animals had a holy book, surely the devil would be human. This is a horrifying story of the trampling of human dignity. Again, during World War II, Nazism and fascism trampled on human dignity in human farm. That horrifying event we read about in Louis Charles Royer's book with named Love Camp. A human farm set up by the Nazis to breed superior human beings and a superior race. Young and beautiful women of the superior race and strong and healthy German soldiers were brought together and bred on this farm. Immediately after the end of the war, when the town where the farm was located was entered, hundreds or even thousands of young German pregnant women were found. Does that sound too horrifying? But it is not over yet. This is just the beginning. According to eugenics, a more advanced version of fascism and racism, a human race could be bred, just as healthy animals could be bred with each other to create good breeds of animals. Social Darwinism was born when some social thinkers took Charles Darwin's argument that weaker creatures that have difficulty adapting to the environment give way to stronger creatures that can adapt to the environment more easily, as a given in sociology. Starting from this simple fact, some people have taken this statement at the level of their own societies and used it to various extents as a tool for political ideologies such as fascism, racism, nationalism, and social Darwinism. Others, starting from the same idea, have applied it to economic relations and used it to support the idea that oppressor-oppressed groups are reasonable and normal, as in some subheadings of capitalism. However, what is often overlooked here is the fact that the theory of evolution is not survival of the fittest, but survival of the most adaptable, the most open to change. For example, the first person to use this short expression strongest was Herbert Spencer, who also developed social Darwinism. But Darwin insisted that it was not vigor, but adaptability and openness to change that was correct. He argued this from the very beginning. The word eugenics comes from the Greek language. It is derived from the Greek words you, meaning good and genes meaning birth. In the early 20th century, this idea, which emerged claiming to be a science, became the sudden rise of scientific racism and the reinterpretation of anthropology for racist and imperialist purposes. In fact, the rise of eugenics is not a coincidence. The late 19th century was a time when science had become a fetish and was now accepted as a panacea for all human problems. So, if there are races within humanity that are defective, faulty, damaged, and have bad characteristics, science will be the solution for them. The concept of eugenics, introduced into the literature in the 1880s by Darwin's cousin Francis Galton, occupied an important place in political debates until the end of the Second World War. The essence of the concept is the attempt to improve the qualitative characteristics of a race or nation. The first proposals on eugenics were to encourage the reproduction of groups beneficial to society based on the laws of heredity and to restrict the offspring of groups deemed harmful. But Charles Darwin was against this theory from the very beginning. First in the United States, the state of Connecticut passed a civil code in 1896. According to this law, it was strictly forbidden for people with epilepsy or mental illness to marry. In 1903, an institution called the American Reproductive Institute was established in the United States to control the issue of marriage and reproduction by the state. In 1911, the Race Correction Agency was launched and the first genealogy was introduced. The initiator was John Harvey Kellogg. Does the name sound familiar? How about Kellogg's? Yes, John Harvey Kellogg was also a nutritionist and entrepreneur. With this institution in practice, national conferences were organized in 1914, 1915, and 1928, and a national movement was started. In this context, eugenics registration offices were established to carry out the work in a more organized manner. In these offices, families and their genetic characteristics were tracked, with the data collected, a report was published identifying groups that were considered maladaptive and weak. And not surprisingly, these weaker races were mostly immigrants, minorities, and the poor. After 1909, based on all this data, organized sterilization practices were initiated for the first time, especially in the state of California. Between 1909 and 1979, according to official records, 20,000 people were sterilized against their will in mental hospitals. In 1927, the U.S. Supreme Court would declare in a scandalous decision that these sterilizations did not violate the Constitution in any way. In fact, one of the judges, Oliver Wendell Holmes, said exactly the following, enough of living with imbeciles. Not just the United States. Historically, similar practices have occurred in Australia, Brazil, Canada, Germany, Japan, China, Denmark, Estonia, Finland, France, Iceland, Norway, Switzerland. 
but Germany was the most comprehensive and horrific example. After 1933, the German precursor of eugenics, which was to become the mainstay of Nazi racial theory, was racial hygiene. Racial hygiene is a movement that argues that public health can be improved by not helping the weak and by killing people born unhealthy or disabled. This view, which did not find social and political support until the Third Reich, was radicalized after Hitler's rise to power, and its proponents took important positions within the state. The Nazis' first work in the field of eugenics was the law on the prevention of hereditarily diseased generations. Under this law, 400,000 people were sterilized without their consent. After a while, of course, sterilization became seen as an inadequate and slow method, and institutions such as the Hartheim Euthanasia Center were open to speed things up and racial cleansing. In this center, people with mental illness genetic diseases and disabilities were killed without their consent. With these euthanasia practices, 200,000 people would be killed. Later, before the gas chambers were established, patients were put in a bus and people were cleaned according to the law by letting the exhaust gas in. In fact, the roots of the idea of eugenics go back much further to ancient Greece. Plato was the first philosopher to argue that the state should control the reproductive actions of citizens. Accordingly, the reproductive level of healthier and more capable individuals should be increased. Likewise, in Sparta, newborn babies were checked by adults, and it was decided whether they would survive or not. Those deemed unhealthy were taken to Mount Tegidus and killed there. Mostly were subjected to this because only the strongest men should live. Adolf Hitler admired the Spartans for this method. Hitler even said the following, Sparta is in my opinion the first purebred state. The killing of sick, weak, and handicapped children is, in my opinion, much more humane and compassionate than today's inhumane practices of birth control and abortion. With abortion, with birth control, you cannot prevent weak races from corrupting future generations. The Romans practiced a similar method. They drowned babies they did not approve of in the Tiber River. The state is not an institution that is above people, but a servant that exists to serve people. Therefore, the state can never be given control over reproductive activities, at least from a eugenic point of view. In some cases, the state can restrict reproduction, for example China, or encourage reproduction, for example Sweden. But if this is to be done, and the reasons for these countries are understandable, it must be applied equally to all citizens and without discrimination. Eugenics is now seen as a type of pseudoscience that has lost its impact and is mixed with racism. It is very likely that the end of man will be self-destruction, not due to any natural event. Even if it is due to a natural event, humans are likely to be responsible for it. Therefore, people need to start using their much vaunted intelligence as soon as possible, and instead of fighting each other and gaining the upper hand, they need to develop and strengthen science against our common enemy, diseases, celestial bodies, etc. Thanks for watching. If you like, please do not forget to subscribe to my channel.